the crowdfunding was so helpful because it is uh, resource intensive to do video production. Mm -hmm. And so to build the healthcare cube, we needed to have a tech platform. We needed to do video content. So it's it's very much more resource intensive than just me consulting. And so crowdfunding was so incredibly vital to kickstarting us and helping sort of bootstrap this operation so that we could build the healthcare cube. Welcome to Empowerista, female entrepreneurs finding freedom and fulfillment in their life and career. I'm your host, Alex Worley, the founder and CEO of Empowerista, an award-winning producer and national TV host seen on platforms like Business Rockstars, Entrepreneur.com, and Amazon Prime. I am so excited to share my candid conversations with successful women as I reveal the tips and truths they've learned on their entrepreneurial journey. My guest today is Megan Nekrabecki, a healthcare administration expert based in Los Angeles who has been innovating across the complex U.S. healthcare system for over a decade. She's the founder and CEO of Healthcare Transformation, the first of its kind boutique healthcare consulting firm focused on creating a value-based consumer-centric healthcare system. Megan graduated at the top of her class at Johns Hopkins with a Master's of Science in Public Health. She's also a speaker and the author of My Healthcare Transformation Handbook, Everything I Need to Manage and Improve My Health. During our chat, Megan explains how she's funded her business through crowdfunding and consulting, plus what an entrepreneur needs to know about signing up for health insurance. Let's dive in. This is so much fun to have you on here. Hi, Al. We have to give everyone a background because they'll figure it out real fast that we go way back. Mm -hmm. College roomies from University of Wisconsin. And I'm just so proud of you and the business that you built. And it's not very often that I get to be a part of an entrepreneur that I'm interviewing their journey before they start the business. Yeah. And I think that's going to be a fun place to start because... Because I remember you studying to become a doctor (laughs) in college, (laughs) these big science books, and at that point, you never expected to be an entrepreneur. You were just really, really passionate about healthcare and eventually public health. You got your master's in public health. So take me back to when you were working at UCLA in LA, where we got reconnected in Los Angeles. So fun. And you obviously saw a void in the market that inspired you to be an entrepreneur. And simultaneously, you were around more entrepreneurs. Take me back to that time. Yeah, of course. So, and I have to give major props to you because you are one of my biggest inspirations for all this. So thank thank you. you. Um, But I'll tell this story, right? So... Um, Yeah, so I would say actually throughout my entire healthcare career, so like you said, I've always been really passionate about healthcare, but once I really got into it, so when I did my master's in public health at Johns Hopkins and was seeing how broken the healthcare system was and is, it really started then and there that I saw that people do not understand how to navigate the healthcare system, right? But I really saw it when I was here in Los Angeles working for the UCLA health system that patients actually would make bad decisions and it would be worse for their health, it'd be worse from a cost standpoint, and this has a really big impact on a both individually and from the system standpoint. And um, really, the healthcare systems don't do enough to educate and empower patients and consumers, their families. And so I saw this gap that I'd been seeing over the years, but then really saw on the ground and said, "Hey, I can I can fix this." And especially being here in Los Angeles as well, there is so much video so much video in every other industry. And so I saw this opportunity that, A, I firmly believe that healthcare is completely shifting and this brick and mortar sick care system is going to do a 180 and it's going to start with recorded video and then go to live video and then you actually eventually go to a brick and mortar. So I believe that there's going to be this huge shift, Um, but I want to help support these health systems in doing that shift while empowering consumers with information through video. Yeah, it's so cool how a clash of experiences kind of brought you to where you are. Because we were talking off camera about we're both from the Midwest. Yeah, you're from Minnesota. I'm from Wisconsin. Obviously, yeah. met in Wisconsin. <laughs> and it's not that entrepreneurship isn't alive and well there. It certainly exists, but mm-hmm. there's a little less risk taking. It's definitely a more traditional, security oriented yes. type of culture. So it. 
I'm sure was really helpful to be out in LA where people are more risk takers. They're willing、mm-hmm. to go outside of the box. Then simultaneously, you were working at UCLA, and and that's a big thing too. Is like. Being in your industry and understanding the nuances of it, do you feel like that chapter was just priceless to set you up for being an entrepreneur? Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, because I completely agree. Right, that the way that we grew up is much more around the you go get a corporate job and you get the benefits and all the things, and you know, and I've lived that life、uh, up until until now. But really, getting to see. Examples through people like yourself and other entrepreneurs. There's so many entrepreneurs here in Los Angeles, and so getting to see them and learn from their experiences and see what that life would look like, and then being able to learn. Right, there's so many accelerators and incubators and mentors and different programs here as well that had supported me throughout my journey and continue to. And so, yeah, I would say that the. That being in corporate and seeing how these health systems run, and it's completely vital to this ability for me to actually go out and help all of these health systems be more patient effective, have better patient experiences, better patient outcomes, all of these things. Yeah, it's totally something. Yeah, for that. I think it's important to not discredit people's time in corporate because、mm-hmm. a lot, and and by all means, if someone's fresh out of college or haven't worked for corporate and they're just feeling called to go straight to entrepreneurship, that's one route. But、mm-hmm. Another route is there is this priceless experience you get working for another business or organization, seeing what works and what doesn't work.、Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, acting on what doesn't work is the concept for your business,、yes. as was the case in your scenario. Yeah, and you know what? It's really interesting too, because especially when it's healthcare entrepreneurship, that's a completely different beast because you have to know healthcare, and actually,、yeah. the healthcare leaders will tell a lot. Of entrepreneurs, this because they there's tons of entrepreneurs who come up with a really awesome tech idea or some sort of solution, but they don't understand the healthcare system. There's a lot of laws and regulations oh, that you yeah, have to well, consider. Yeah, well, and then just understanding the operations of how would you actually implement this, and and so there's so many things to think about. And so if you haven't been inside the system, and I think this is where I have a ton of value because of the experience that I've had of being in the system, that I 100. Understand how it works and how it should work, and so from an entrepreneur standpoint, I've already got that going for us in in moving forward. Awesome. Okay,、yeah. let's tell everyone about the time that we walked around the block in Mar, <laughs> Mar Vista and、yeah. basically drummed up your business. <laughs> yes. So I basically I reached out to Al. <laughs> That's me, like, by the way. That's her nickname for me, Al. <laughs> Just call me Al. Yeah. And、um, but so. I was like, I need to talk to you, right? Because I have had this vision and knew I wanted to start this company, but this is a totally new thing for me, right? And so, grabbed you. We literally walked the block in Mar、uh-huh. Vista and many times. <laughs> yeah, we just kept going、yeah. and going, <laughs> and、um, really just talked about what is this like? I have this idea. What do you think? And I have to tell you, you were so. Supportive of me and my ability to go off and do this on my own, and you've just been an incredible inspiration for me to be able to go and do this. And so,、um, yeah, that's really where it started. I look back. I was just telling this story the other day, where I look back at that moment as like that was the moment that I knew I was going to start the company, and and it didn't mean leaving the company that I was at, but it at least meant. Starting my own company and moving that forward. Yeah, well, it's an honor to be a part of your journey and、yeah. to be on this journey together. I think that is so important to have friends and a support、oh, system 100%. that gets you and affirms you, and that you can bounce ideas off of each other and wear that for each other, which is really,、yeah. really cool.、Um, but kudos to you for not only having an idea but actually acting on it. So, what was it that was a part of either that conversation or I'm. Sure Sure, a lot of conversations and research to follow that allowed you to actually come up with a business plan and take action on it. Yeah, so I would say that there was multiple different things happening, right? And so I. Had the vision, right? And so I think I laid out what that vision and sort of strategy would be around that. And then there's the actual business plan of it, where I've had tons of mentors who've given me advice from the business, financial, strategy, all of these different kind of items to go through.、Um, and then really, it's taking action. It's just the biggest thing is because you have to start taking the action, and that there's going to be so much you don't know. I cannot tell you how much I've learned throughout my entire entrepreneurship experience because. 
it's constantly that there's some sort of barrier or thing you don't know and you just got to figure it out, find people who know, go on the internet, do whatever you have to do to to come up with that and then just move it forward. Um, And then eventually I had to come to this kind of crux in the road where it's you know, when do I leave the company and actually take this leap into the, into my own company? <clears throat> um, and so that was uh, a major turning point too, of not just starting the company, but okay, now when do I take the leap? Yeah. So let's talk about that because you definitely took a leap of faith. Mm-hmm. You were one of those people that was like, I'm not going to wait until I have <laughs> yeah. no other choice because the business is just so big that I have to leave. You were like, no, I'm going to take a leap of faith, leave. I believe in this vision. The business model is there. I want to put all of my time and effort into it. So how did you find that courage and confidence and, and what was it that made you just know? Yeah. So I would say financial security is the first big one is that I was getting consulting clients on the side and felt comfortable that moving forward, I'd have those clients and have that financial security to be able to help build my own business. And even if you're not matching your income, which I don't know if you are or not, but that's aside the point is that as long as you can pay your bills, yeah, you know, like, yeah, bare minimum, yeah. And it's kind of changing your lifestyle, right? Because you do get used to having tons of financial security and having more of a cushy lifestyle. And so you just got to shift somewhat to, to achieve your goals and dreams. And because you get more time back. So that's, that's part of the balance is do I need more money right now or do I need more time right now? Well, and you know what? One of the big things too, was that I actually got to this point where I felt like by still being at the health system that I was actually hurting healthcare transformation rather than helping it. Right. Because it's really hard when you're working to build something and people are like, well, you're still at this other company. What are you doing there? In exactly right time, right? So it's so there's the the vision, but then also the timing that you're spending a ton of time at your day job. And so I actually got to this point where I felt like I would actually help my own company more if I left and had the full, you know, this is where I work, this is what I do, and I have the time to do it. Yeah. So, so you started out with consulting, which is a really great revenue stream to start out with because it's cash flow immediately. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some business models obviously are more capital intensive and it can take a longer time to get a profit, but you can get profit coming in right away through consulting. So that's smart. You were really focusing on that while you were developing the healthcare cube. And um, so tell me a little bit about that, of how you have different revenue streams and they really complement and support each other. Yes. So the healthcare cube, so I'll start by telling folks about what that is, but basically what we're doing is we are crowdsourcing healthcare expertise and then curating it into videos that people can see. Stream. So I kind of joke that it's a Netflix of healthcare. Yeah. <laughs> um, but basically, this concept that, because I can see how people are so confused when it comes to navigating a specific healthcare situation. So, whether it's signing up for health insurance or navigating a pregnancy or maybe a parent is hospitalized, whatever the situation is, you can go to the healthcare cube and stream that content so that you can better navigate, have better health outcomes at a better price, right? And so, while we're building the healthcare cube, the goal is that these health systems can start better, and this is from a consulting standpoint and a separate revenue stream, that we can support them in revamping how they provide care and better integrate the content from the healthcare cube or help them create their own customized video content so that they're helping patients have a better patient experience, a better patient health outcome. Yeah, so so they're really complementary. They go hand Mm -hmm. in hand, and that consulting has been really critical in allowing you to build the more capital-intensive product. And the way you went around doing that to raise the capital is you did crowdfunding. Yes, I did. With Indiegogo. (laughs) I'm a supporter, backer, no big deal. Thanks, Al. (laughs) And it was so fun watching you do this because you were just fearless and courageous and (laughs) and asking, you know, your your friends, your supporters, your family to back you because you believe in this so much. That would be really scary for a lot of people. So I would love to break down what it's like to do a crowdfunding campaign. Let's start with, first of all, why you chose crowdfunding. There's a lot of different ways to fund Mm -hmm. your business. Why crowdfunding? Yes. So I knew that. So first of all, I don't want to go take investor funds at this point in the company. And actually, uh, comprehensively, I'd like to self-fund as much as possible, right? And so until I get to that point where I need it, I'm going to avoid it. 
Hey, super quick, if this episode is inspiring you, I'd be so very grateful if you did any or all of the following. Subscribe to the podcast, review the podcast, or take a screenshot of this episode and post it to your Instagram stories and tag at Empowerista so I can share your post. Your support seriously means so much and will allow me to continue making episodes. Lastly, if you'd like to read the key points from today's interview, head to empoweristapodcast.com for show notes. And and what is the reason behind that? Just so you can truly hone in and be the visionary? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is my baby, right? Yeah. And so I just want to make sure that I have as much control as possible because I think at the end of the day, my passion is helping people and that it's helping them by reducing systemic healthcare costs and having better better health, right? I Mm -hmm. want people to be happy and healthy and be able to do that in an affordable manner. And so I just get concerned about what the incentive is, whether, um, whether it's financial or financial and helping people, it's, it's a different balance when you bring in investors, right? And so I just want to maintain the integrity of the vision and the passion in my mission as much as possible. Um, so I would say that's sort of one of the main, um, reasons there, but but yeah, so working to self-fund as much as possible, which I had, you know, accrued my savings. I'm very big into finances and budgeting and all of the yeah. things. And so I had done a really good job of preparing for this moment. Um, but the crowdfunding was so helpful because it is, it is, uh, resource intensive to, do video production. Mm -hmm. And so to build the healthcare cube, we needed to have a tech platform. We needed to do, we needed to produce video content. So it's a, it's very much more resource intensive than just me consulting. And so crowdfunding was so incredibly vital to kickstarting us and helping sort of bootstrap this operation so that we could build the healthcare cube. Yeah, it's really leveraging technology to get some seed funding from yes. from your inner network. Um, but I know that you said it's a lot of work. It yep. was worth it. It was worth it. Yep. But make no mistake, it's a lot of work. So let's break down kind of what that work is. And of course, it starts with even just building your crowdfunding page. And in your case, you got a video, which is definitely recommended. So you can really leverage the art of storytelling. So mm-hmm. what all went into that to make sure that your story was clear, the problem you were solving, your why, what it was that you were going to use this money toward, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, you know, and we're creating video. So it was very important that we had a video in our crowdfunding. Right. Um, but yeah, so it was a lot of work where it really had to, first it was deciding the platform that you're going to crowdfund on because there's quite a few options now. Um, then we had to actually create the the landing page, right? So it's what content are we putting on there so that when people go to the page, they feel very confident in what we're building and why we're building it and how they can contribute. You have to think about what perks you're going to give folks in in uh, an exchange in for exchange what for they're donating. Yeah, yep, exactly. And then we had to create the video, which again is similar to creating the content, but creating video and scripting is completely different. So that was a lot of work there, and obviously filming and editing. Um, so just creating the page in and of itself tons of work, right? Because you yeah. got the perks, the content, the video. But then from there, you have to create an entire marketing campaign right. of how am I getting the word out about this? And it's not just set it and forget it. No, it's like that's not where the at real all. work starts. Like I was like exhausted watching you. <laughs> yeah. It's a ton, a ton of work. And so that's my biggest advice to anyone is that go into crowdfunding knowing that it is going to be a ton of work. I even had friends who forewarned me, um, but it was a lot, a lot of work. So yeah. So let's break down what some of those marketing techniques were that you used. Um, I was on the receiving end of some yeah. of them. So I, I know that what stood out to me was your personal text messages. You know, because that's like, oh, like she's asking me a favor. I'm her friend. Of course I want to help her. Like that really resonated with me. Um, And then if you want to expand upon some of the other tactics that you did. Yeah, of course. So basically built out an entire marketing plan, really focusing first on the people, right? So I had an entire list of who are my people. So friends, family, past coworkers, current coworkers, um, whether it's a group that I'm involved in, old people we used to dance with, you know, it's <laughs> literally, it runs the gamut that I'm like, who do I know? Um, mentors, et cetera. And so really started with that list. And then it was, how am I actually going to communicate this? And so one of the things too, is that that's really important with crowdfunding is that you want a 
a pile of money to come in rather immediately. And so you really need to reach out to your close friends and family so that they are very aware that crowdfunding is coming and that they can give, they can pitch in sort of right from the beginning. So starting there. Because it creates that social proof in the beginning where this is legitimate, real people are backing it, people are more likely to back something that other people are backing. Yes, the social proof is unreal. I would say the social proof even came into play much more towards the end of the campaign where I did an entire uh, mailing campaign right to my mailing list. Emailing, and, yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. And I would. <laughs> you know, the not, old school. I put a mail stamp mail. on it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get it in five days. Closes in seven. You got two days to donate. <laughs> to clarify, electronic mail. <laughs> um, like we even have to clarify these days. But just in case you were wondering. The mailing list. Um, but yeah, so I created an entire email campaign <laughs> um, where in the campaign I was very clear about who was backing us um, and so I had sort of these different tiers where who's backed us with 20, 50, 100, 500 um, so that it showed and it, because it's recognition in yeah. the first place I'm so grateful and thankful to anyone who has decided to back us because that is their money and they're choosing to put their yeah. money towards us and they believe in the cause and believe in us that we're able to execute and so it's a recognition piece to all of those folks but then also from a social proof standpoint, it's unbelievable how when people see that other people are backing it, they say, oh, I I believe in this too. I want to be a part of this. And um, so I would say that's a big component. Um, But yeah, so the emailing campaign, text messages, private emails, I cannot tell you. I mean, so obviously I would have a sort of template to work off of as much as possible, but you got to personalize it, you know? And so I cannot tell you how I was getting the screen time notifications to get off yeah. my phone. Oh, funny. Yeah. Like, I mean, not right now, Siri. <laughs> I'm like, I'm busy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, but it's a ton of work because imagine every single individual text message, individual email, as much as you're doing still these emailing campaigns as much as possible, there's still yeah, a lot of work that to be is done. a lot of work. I think personability is a big trend in marketing right now. People want to feel seen and sought after, and like you're speaking directly to them. And I don't even think that's in an egotistical way. I can relate to as a consumer. Oh, totally. A lot of times, you just feel like it's this widespread and like that it's not applicable to you but if yes, someone can mass show marketing. yeah if someone can show you no i really have you in mind yes it just resonates so much more and you did a great job at the end of um little things of like upselling like oh would you like to up your donation from you know 20 to 50 i'm forgetting what exactly was yeah. or, or or you um really made your goal known like here's why i am now here's where i want to be by the end of yes, the week like can you one. help me get there so tactics like that really resonate with me oh, at, good to at, hear. on the receiving end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And, um, you know, I think it's funny what your note on personalization because it's very, very true. I actually even had someone who is a close family friend who I 100% personalized the text message, but I didn't get a response. And so I sent her another text and she was like, oh, I thought that was just a mass text thing, oh. you know? And so the personalization, I mean, I was like, I even personalized that. That was me, Yeah, you know? And so it's very interesting, this concept now we're getting bombarded with messages constantly yeah so. where something goes off in your brain we're like oh ignore you yeah know, that, that's not meant for me yeah but if it if you can personally so much to the extent we're like no, no this is like it's rude if I don't uh, yeah. respond yeah literally. <laughs> then you're more likely to respond for sure yeah but yeah so just know that crowdfunding is it's a ton of work but I think knowing these techniques and these tactics um, they'll help you be successful and get to a point where you have enough money to sort of kickstart you and be able to bootstrap mm-hmm. A little bit more. So, and we're so obsessed with followers and marketing. So, I think sometimes people might think, "Oh, in order to get sales to raise money, I have to have this huge following." You don't have an abnormally large following. You really mm-hmm. tapped into the people that you know, and and there's really a lesson there. Like, tap into your network first. They're the ones that care the most first. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I would say the majority of the folks who backed us were people who know me in some way, shape, or um, form. So I think that's a huge, a huge point is that the people who know you are going to be your biggest fans, your biggest supporters. And so really making sure that you're um, like getting their support, but then also supporting them back right now. It's really awesome too, because at the end of crowdfunding, I feel like I sort of have this, um, this crew, right. That I'm like, Oh, okay. I got these people and they, they backed me. They believe in me. They're supporting me. And I, I owe it to them also to be successful. 
successful in this and show impact. Mm. And so it is a very awesome feeling actually after it's all done because I, I want to keep them posted and be like, hey, what this is what's happening now. And you know, so it's a very That's it's a very awesome. awesome. Yeah. Let's talk about the emotional aspect. It sounds like there is a lot of positives where you're feeling more motivated. You probably felt all the love, the support, but I'm sure there were, I would imagine at least if yeah. I were doing crowdfunding, there would be a couple things that would pop up for me. One, I think I would feel uncomfortable asking for money to people that I know. And I'm not saying that you should feel uncomfortable because being on the receiving end, I didn't think anything of it. I was like, great, good for her. Of course I want to support. But I think I could feel uncomfortable being the asker. Mm -hmm. And then inevitably you're going to hear no, which feels really uncomfortable. So tell me about that component. Yes. So 100% agree, right? And so the, uh, for the first point for feeling comfortable asking for money, you just got to go for it. You just got to do it. Just and get over it. Who cares? Yeah. Feel feel bad about yeah. it. Like feel uncomfortable. Well, I think it depends too about where you're coming from, right? So for me, my passion comes from, like I said, this is for the people. I'm working to build something that is going to help people. And I've seen it. I know how it's going to help people. And I feel very passionately about that. And so when I'm asking for money, it's not like I'm like, hey, because I want to go buy a coffee yeah. or like, you <laughs> yeah. know. And so it's like, no, this is actually, I have a vision and I'm going to execute off of this vision. I really, really need your support right now. And so I think if you're coming from this really true, meaningful place, um, I think it's very easy to get over that you're asking for money and think more about what are you actually asking for and that's the downstream what you get to do with that money. I love that because you were so clear in what your why is and you were leading with your why with them. So Mm -hmm. it's not like you were saying, give me money. You were saying, give this cause, this very worthy cause money. And that did really come through. Okay, good. (laughs) Good to hear. Um, What about the nose? Oh, the nose. Okay, so, and I think you know this. I've done business development sales before. Um, I don't like the nose. No. <laughs> I don't think anyone nose does. Nose are not fun. Nose are not fun. Um, yeah. And so it's just one of those things though, where you just got to put up with the uncomfortableness and the awkwardness. I mean, I even had close friends who said, you know, right now we're working to save up for X, Y, and Z. And so, you know, and it's totally, And totally it's reasonable, fine. but it still stings. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. It's just, it is what it is. And we all have our own finances and you never know what people are going through and what they have to pay for. Maybe they're supposed Supporting a you know an elderly family member and you have no idea whatever it is you know and so um, so you just you just take the no and you move on because honestly it's like anything in life that there's going to be highs and there's going to be lows and so you just got to roll with the punches and keep fighting and because there's so many highs I mean I had people who were backing us with five hundred dollars you know That's and so amazing did you do a happy dance <laughs> <laughs> oh I can't even tell you I was like what is happening um, but yeah but so it's you take these no's and then you move forward you get tons of yeses and you really have to be so grateful and thankful for your supporters and so it's really shifting your perspective on the ones that are supporting you. Yes, absolutely. Just okay, being strong. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's end on this note. You're a healthcare expert for entrepreneurs watching and listening, if, especially if they're in that transition of going from working for a company where they're getting benefits, aka health insurance, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they're leaving, and all of a sudden they have to get their own health insurance. That can feel really, really overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, what can you tell them to yeah. ease their nerves, first of all, and also what are some good options for them to consider? Yeah, 100%. So it's really interesting because now since I actually did this leap into the entrepreneur space, yeah. then I do the same thing where I had to figure out where am I getting my health insurance. And so I totally empathize with the feeling that it can be scary and overwhelming. Uh, fortunately, I work in the space and so it's not too overwhelming, but so happy to give some sort of tips. So um, so when you leave your benefits, which I know can be scary, uh, there's tons of available options for you. So uh, I would say the first is that you can get health insurance through someone else, right? So if you are under 26, you can get it off your parents. You can get it off your spouses if you guys are partners or married, depending on their companies and their insurance. Um, so look at those options. But then the other big option that's available now is the health insurance marketplaces. So every single state has their own. It's either called a health insurance exchange or a health insurance marketplace, but it came through the Affordable Care Act that was passed back in 2010. And so basically, if you go to healthcare.gov and then you put in your zip code, it will take you to your marketplace. And then that allows you to actually go on and shop for plans. And what's nice here is that there's 
They have the 10 essential covered benefits that are on there. So you know that it's a good covered plan, that it's not, it's not a skimpy plan, if you will. And then also there's tiers. So it will let you know very clearly, will this cover 90% of my costs or 80% of my costs? They have these metal tiers. Um, so that's helpful when you're shopping for plans. And then the other thing is that if you go online to these marketplaces to get your insurance plan, there's also tax credits if you make under 400% of the federal poverty level. So that's a another benefit of going on to these exchanges. So you can absolutely go on there. Um, you have to either be signing up during open enrollment, which is in the fall, or there's a special open enrollment for things like losing your coverage and other things like that. So, um, so that's another big, big option. And then I would say the last option is that if you're going full force into entrepreneurship and you're not even making an income, the other option is Medicaid. So Medicaid is specifically made, it's again, a state-based program, but it's specifically made for folks who are low income. And so you just have to look at your state and search Medicaid and see what the eligibility requirements are. That's another great option. Yeah, thanks for breaking that all down. I can remember when I had to get insurance on my own. My husband is also an entrepreneur, so we had to go through healthcare.gov. We pay full price. Admittedly, it's it's a lot of money, and and I think that that's I something um, that scares people the most. Of all of a sudden, an employer is not covering it, and I have this new big expense. Um, and the thing I just want to say real quick is, I think that you just have to look at your budget in totality. So okay, so my health insurance price went up. Where yep. can I bring it down a little bit? You know, so we we don't extend ourselves too much in housing. You know, we maybe could have, yeah. Um, and now we're putting that towards health insurance. So I think that there's definitely a way to do it if you really just think in terms of numbers, yeah, and, and like what you need to rearrange. Yeah, I wouldn't let that be a barrier to if you have something that you truly believe in and starting a company. I wouldn't let this concept of health insurance be too much of a barrier because it is possible to rearrange your funding and be able to get that health insurance. And it's really important to have health insurance because costs continue to rise. And so if you're at risk of something happening, it's going to be really expensive. You know, the Kaiser Family Foundation just came out with a report that the average family, so a four-person family, now pays over $22,000 a year to have health insurance. Oh my goodness. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So yeah, so it's, it is a barrier to a lot of folks because a lot of, if you're getting your health insurance through an employer, they're subsidizing a lot of that. And so it is something to consider, but you can go on and you can shop for plans and you can see how much the pricing would be and it is something to consider. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for your expertise. And if you want to learn more about getting health insurance, they can go to your platform to learn about yes, it, right? Yes, thehealthcarecube.com. Awesome. <laughs> Megan, thank you so much. This was so thank much fun. Thank you, Al. I know. This was great. <laughs> Well, that's it for today's show. As a reminder, show notes are available at empoweristapodcast.com. And I'd be so grateful if you'd subscribe, review, or share this podcast. Thank you so much for listening and have an amazing week.